we often think that God the Father is this angry, vengeful person. He's the Old Testament God who's ready to nuke us and wipe us out. And it took the New Testament God, Jesus, to sort of talk him off the ledge and say, don't kill him, I died for them. But the gospel says God the Father so loved the world he gave his son. God the Father planned this. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, where it's our goal to help Christians love and live out God's Word. I'm Aaron Nicholson. I'm joined with Jesse Randolph. We're pastors here at Indian Hills Community Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. And listeners and viewers, we're we're thankful for you joining us today. If you haven't yet, please subscribe on YouTube or follow on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That'll keep you up to date on the latest content and also help us reach more people through those, those platforms. Today, we're going to discuss Paterology, the study of God the Father. And we've invited a, a pastor uh, who's written on this subject, Dr. Ryan Rippey. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, Dr. Rippey. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. Well, listeners, uh, Dr. Rippey is pastor of Trinity Church in Benicia, California. He's president of the Cornerstone Bible College and Seminary. So, yes, we're, we're thankful to have you uh, on this podcast. And I believe, Pastor Jesse, you and Dr. Rippey have met before. We have. We've met face-to-face. I was able to visit uh, the seminary that he's president of probably five years ago now. Yeah. Um, it was around the time this book was coming out. I was reading the book uh, for a seminary class, was uh, really just edified by it, and it just worked out through a business trip that I was able to take up his way to visit with him, and now we have the privilege of interviewing him on our podcast. <laughs> and I, I don't have a better transition than to get right into the content. So, uh, Dr. Rippey, speaking of that book, it's titled That God May Be All in All. You wrote it in 2018, and it's called A Paterology, Demonstrating That the Father is the Initiator of All Divine Activity. Could you give us a bit of a, a lowdown about why you wrote the book in the first place? Yeah, this was my PhD dissertation. Uh, back in 2004, when I was a student here at Cornerstone Seminary, I was taking theology proper class from a uh, dear mentor, Frank Griffith, and he I had taken the class from him at the Bible college level one time, and so he said, hey, you need to do something different. Why don't you write a paper on God the Father? Nobody's writing on this. Here, read Tom Smale's book, The Forgotten Father. And so I said, okay. I, start, I read Tom Smale's book, The Forgotten Father, and it started a period of study from 2004 until I finished my PhD in 2016 of, of investigating the topic of the first person of the Trinity, his person and work. And so that's, that's what got the ball rolling and uh, not knowing that this would become just a delightful study of God. And John 17, three says, this is eternal life to know the only true God and Jesus whom he sent. And so this has been a study that's been, um, delightful to my soul to learn more about our God. Awesome. We're thankful for those 14 years or so of study uh, (laughs) that we get to benefit from here today on this podcast. So, Dr. Rippey, we'll start with basic terminology. Uh, What is paterology? Where does the word come from? And also, if you could add, how does this fit in systematic theology? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So, when I was coming up with the use of that word, uh, paterology, there were no standards in the academic dictionaries, encyclopedias, even in systematic theologies. There's a one systematic by Floyd Berrickman, which is not really very well known that he has a whole chapter devoted to paterology, but it comes from the Greek word for father, pater, and ology, the study of. And so it was meant to be similar to Christology and pneumatology, that is the study of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, and the study of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And so where it fits in with systematic theology is it really is a subset of theology proper. When we think of our theology proper classes in seminary, what those really are is a study of the Trinity, maybe the attributes of God, how we define the doctrine of the Trinity. And sometimes in theology proper, we get to the work of creation and providence and maybe the divine decree. But paterology is not so much concerned about defining the doctrine of the Trinity or the attributes of God, assuming that but looking at the person and work of God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, and what he's doing. Hmm. So that's that's the distinction. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's helpful. How does, uh, well, the fatherhood of God, you just mentioned uh, Floyd Barakman's uh, systematic theology, uh, like you said, not not very well read and very well known. That's a shame. It's, it's, a, it's got some really good aspects to it, some great chapters. But the fatherhood of God is an, an overlooked aspect of, of systematic theology and theology proper in many discussions. Why do you think that's so? Why is the father, the first person of the Trinity, overlooked in so many theological discussions? Yeah, I found a really great quote when I was doing this where Gerald Bray, in one of his books on the doctrine of God, said that from the third century, there's not been writing on the first person of the Trinity as a person in his own right. So for Gerald Bray said for 1700 years, of course, I latched onto that quote and stuck it in my first chapter <laughs> saying, this is why I'm writing. But I think he he gets to a good point in his further discussion that for the Greco-Roman world, atheism didn't exist. So attacks on the first person of the Trinity didn't happen. Mm. Uh, everybody assumed the father is God. Mm -hmm. uh, even within Judaism, the assumption would be the father. We couldn't call him that, of course, but he's God, the first person of the Trinity. It was the attacks on the deity of the son and the spirit, which led to the, the creeds led to uh, the defense of of the person of uh, hypostatic union, all that stuff. And so the father, because that doctrine was not attacked, it didn't have to be defended and further defined. It's not until you get to atheism or perhaps competing views of who God is within a broader circle. And so I think that's why it's been neglected. I think also there's another reason is that when we look at the word God in the Bible, very often, like if I ask you, what do you think of when you think of the word God? Do you, do you, is your first thought to think of the first person of the Trinity or is it to think of the whole Trinity? How is the word theos, God, used in the New Testament? And prior to my own study, I would have assumed it was for the Trinity. And so it would minimize the amount of verses that are talking about the first person. Right. But what we begin to see is that the use of God, theos, and Kurios, Lord, are always for persons and not for the Trinity. And then it opens up, okay, this is what the first person is doing when it says God. It's not God in the generic. It's not God the Trinity. It's God the Father. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about uh, people didn't write about paterology because uh, there was no atheism, but now atheism is, is more popular today. And that's what you're suggesting, that atheism is more on the rise since the uh, early church existence? Sure. And I mean, if we think about uh, the person of God the Father, there are not a lot of attacks on his person and work in terms of a lot of people don't e wouldn't even separate his work from Trinitarian work, which rightly so with the doctrine of inseparable operations, that is, that when one person of the Trinity works, all the persons work. Think of creation, for example. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the use of God in the New Testament, which we could go back to Genesis 1, that's the first person of the Trinity. And we see in Scripture, he created through the Son and by the Spirit. So the Son and Spirit are not separate from the work of creation, but the Father is, is creating through the Son and by the Spirit, which gets to my subtitle that all of the works of God, the Father's the initiator, the Son is the executor. And the Spirit's the perfecter. Those are words that the early church used to describe how each person of the Trinity had distinct appropriations within the one work of God. It's why we don't worship three gods, because they're working out of the same power. Right. Yeah. Would you be willing to flesh that out a little bit? Elaborate on what does the Bible teach us about God the Father and his role within the Trinity? Yeah, so you have uh, the traditional terms of uh, the Father is unbegotten, mm -hmm. and and the Son is eternally begotten, and the Spirit eternally proceeds. And so, some of the early church fathers would use an illustration of a fountain and say that the Father is the fountainhead of deity. Um, and there's been controversy with that uh, over the years, but this idea of God being the first person of the Trinity, the Father. I think it's helpful to look at the divine names and see that they're not arbitrary and they're not temporary. Hmm. So the father has always been the father. He's the eternal father and the son has been always the son. And so he's the eternal son 
Likewise, the Spirit is the eternal Spirit. And so their roles are not interchangeable. Their roles are not reversible. And there's this beautiful, uh, the, the formal word is taxis. It's a Greek word for order. It's the reason we call them first person, second person, third person. And so the Father, when we look at Scripture, for example, I think of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, I've got my Bible open up to it. It's kind of a good summary of, of this, like all of redemptive history and that the Father's the one who is initiating all of it. Picking up at verse 8 there of chapter 1, uh, that we're to share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And I would assume that's the Father, and I'll show you why here in a moment, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And so the Father, we know it's the Father because he's the one who gave us this salvation in Christ Jesus. And so he's purposed, he's graced, it's before the ages began, and now verse 10 has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So from eternity past, the Father purposing and planning, to the sending of His Son at the high point of the ages to be our Savior, to then bringing immortality and life to light through the gospel, which goes into the eternal state. The Father has been the initiator of all of this. And mm. so that that's um, kind of my go-to verse to show the big picture. And then we could dig down into the details, but... Well, yeah, I'm interested in some of those details. And I know that's the the subtitle of your book, uh, A Paterology Demonstrating That the Father is the Initiator of All Divine Activity. Uh, yeah, Dr. Rippey, do you have other um, biblical passages you like to go to to support that point? Why'd you choose that subtitle for your book? Yeah, so when you write a dissertation at a PhD level... You cannot have just a topic to yeah. talk about. You have to have a thesis to argue. So when I went to do my PhD, I knew I wanted to write on the topic of God the Father, but I wasn't sure what my thesis was going to be. And through the research, I began to see that whether it's the big picture of, I mentioned creation, but if we say redemption, the Father said here in Second Timothy 1, he's the Savior. Well, he saves by sending his son at Christmas and sending his spirit at Pentecost. And so redemptive history and this wonderful story of salvation, the father's initiating, the son is the one who became incarnate and is executing this salvation. And the spirit is the one who's our seal and perfect pledge that we will be recipients of this salvation. And so you have the big picture but then when you get into the details, maybe you take a doctrine like um, adoption, and we could turn to, oh, I think of uh, Paul in Galatians 4. This is a great little passage to see all three persons. Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God, again, the Father, sent forth his Son. That's how we know it's the Father there is because in the context, it's, it's not the Trinity. It's the Father sending forth his Son, born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because your sons, God, the Father, has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so all three persons are there. The Father's initiating. The Son is executing. The eternal Son became the incarnate Son so we could become adopted sons. And then the Spirit is perfecting that by stirring up family affections in our hearts through His indwelling ministry so we cry out, Abba, Father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we could go through every detail of, of the work of, of God and see that the Father initiates, the Son executes, and the Spirit perfects. It's a delightful study. That's, yeah. what I, that's yeah. my book in a nutshell. Yeah, and, and it is a persuasive and compelling book. And most importantly, it's a, a biblically reasoned book. And um, I'd encourage our, our audience to, to go get a copy of it. I'm sure we'll put a copy in the show notes. Yes, we will. Um, Dr. Rippey, I'm sure the question you get for by those who maybe push back a little bit or just have insightful questions for you is how do we uphold your thesis here, which is that God is the God the Father is the initiator of all divine activity. How do we uphold that truth while at, at the same time not minimizing either the deity of the Son or the deity of the Spirit, mm. because each is fully God, as we know. 
Right. That's an excellent question, and I think that was the error of Judaism, for example, Hmm. that they wanted to uphold the glory of the Father and say the Son is not God. That was what we see in the Gospels. Or we can say that's the error of the early heresies of the church, like Arianism, who said that for the Son there was, oh, sure, he's close to God, but there was a time when the Son was not. And so we have to We have to hold this balance, and I think the way historically the church fathers have dealt with this, which is helpful to us, is to say the father's the initiator, the son's the executor, the spirit's the perfecter, but it's not three works. It's one work. We worship one God, not three gods. And so because they're working out of the same divine power, the same divine nature, when they work, they cannot work separately, nor do they work contrary to purposes nor does it mean one is inferior. Um, I have a quote from Basil of Caesarea. I don't, I wish I knew it off the top of my head. Let me see if I have it here in the notes, but it's a really helpful quote to talk about this. And he's referring to another verse, Ephesians 2.18. Ephesians 2.18, of course, is the high point of Paul's argument in Ephesians talking about now that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that now we have access to the Father. And whether we're Jew or Gentile, we're able to actually come into the presence of the Father. And I'll read you 2.18, for through him, that's Jesus in the context, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. And so we see this reversal of this ordering By the power of the Spirit, the indwelling ministry that he had talked about that we're the temple now, through the finished work of Christ in union with him that he had talked about in chapter 1, we can draw near to the Father. So the Father initiated our salvation to bring us near. The Son executed it. The Spirit perfected it. And now by the power of the Spirit, through union with the Son, Ephesians 2.18, we draw near to the Father. But he basically says that we have to say we worship the Father through the Son by the Spirit, but we also worship the Father with the Son along with the Spirit. So we have to keep this balance that, yes, there is an ordering of the persons, but they're all equal. And so in application to the the, the teaching of worship, whether it be prayer or singing, this idea of drawing near communion with God— We do draw near to the Father, just like Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, but we pray to the Father through the Son in the power of the Spirit, but we're worshiping the Father along with the Son, along with the Spirit. And so it's this, the minute you get into the doctrine of the Trinity, you get into this this balance of saying they are different persons. We don't believe in modalism, that they're just one God who has different faces, but They are all God worthy of worship, and so we cannot diminish or or uh, make one inferior to another. Yeah, and I'm thankful for for God's uh, helpful, tangible example in First Corinthians 11. God is the head of Mm. Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Mm. Uh, Not inferior, uh, but different. I mean, I suppose man and woman are inferior, but uh, we we reflect the Godhead in that way. Yeah, yeah, that creator creature distinction helps us, doesn't it? Yes. That 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 there's a line. Yes, there is this ordering of father, son, spirit, but all are God and they're the creator, mm-hmm. worthy of worship. Yeah. And we're the creature. And right. so when we begin to diminish the son or spirit, it's because we're refusing to see them as God. Mhm. The danger, of course, would be to say, we're only going to glorify the Father. Well, what did the Father say? He said, this is my Son, listen to Him. Right. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Father and Holy Spirit are the most Christ-centered persons on the in the universe, saying, look at Jesus, behold Him. The Spirit's ministry is to glorify the Son. But then yet, we worship the Spirit as well, who uh, J.I. Packer, of course, uh, said is the shy member of the Trinity because he always deflects the glory to the to the Son. But nevertheless, the Spirit is worthy of worship as well because he's God. Yeah, excellent point. So we're talking a lot about some theological topics, uh, some, some heavy topics to understand, mm-hmm. uh, even some that are incomprehensible. Uh, but how, let's bring it down. How has your study impacted your own personal worship? 
How has it influenced your personal relationship to the triune God? Well, what I tell my people, I think this has become a big um, hobby horse of mine in my preaching, whether at my own church or itinerant preaching or even training my students is it is it is how you approach the Father. The whole reason that we've been given this salvation is that we will be with God forever, that we'll be in his presence and we'll have communion with him. And so we're in the midst of sin or we're in the midst of trials. Sometimes our temptation is to say, I can't draw near to God. I got to clean myself up before I come near to him. And the reality is that he's our father and the son has united us to himself so that we have access to the father. He's our high priest seated at the father's right hand. And the spirit is ministering family affections, shedding abroad the father's love in our hearts, Romans 5, 5, so that we would draw near. So if we think that in the midst of our sin or the midst of our our temptations and our struggles or this fallen world that we have to clean ourselves up or get right, we're misunderstanding God. Romans 8 says that he's not given us a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but he's given us the spirit of adoption. And so when we're pressed by the cares of life, what I would want anybody reading my book to know, anybody listening to this teaching to know is that when you are pressed, you would want to know this truth so deeply that your instinct is to run to the Father and not from Him. I saw a little meme uh, on Facebook that I thought made the point really well. Religion says, I've blown it, my Father's going to kill me. The gospel says, I've blown it, I need to call my Father. (laughs) And that's the heart of what I think I've learned the most, is that we're New Covenant Christians who are able to come near and draw near through the finished work of the Son in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And as Christians, so often we want to live in old covenant realities, thinking we have to have the clean and unclean laws and and do all of these hoops in order to even maybe come into the outer court, not even into the Holy of Holies. But no, we can draw near into the presence of God. And that's what we, in prayer, in communion, in gathering together, in singing, and in, in all of these things, we should be going to God. So, so my biggest learning point that I think is so practical is we often think that God the Father is this angry, vengeful person. He's the Old Testament God who's ready to nuke us and wipe us out. And it took the New Testament God, Jesus, to sort of talk him off the ledge and say, don't kill him. I died for them. But the gospel says, God the Father so loved the world, he gave his son. God the Father planned this. And I think a lot of it comes because earthly fathers fail us, don't they? So many people have fathers who were abusive or absent, or they were just not a good example of a father. But God the Father is not a father like that. He's the one who's the giver of every good and perfect gift in whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. He's the one who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. He's the one who's given us his son and given us his spirit. And that's why if he won't, didn't spare his own son, how will he not with him freely give us all things? This is, this is why it's so important. This is why we need to know this. I love that. I, uh, Dr. Rippey, uh, Aaron, I appreciate the question, what you're getting at there, um, but I appreciate, Dr. Rippey, your answer there. You're you're demonstrating, first of all, impressively in about 30 minutes, a, an ability to grasp and articulate matters of theological precision, the Trinity. Not everybody can do that in 30 minutes, but then to, to then bring it down to the pastoral level, right? To just uh, help us see what this this doctrine means to us practically day over day as, as followers of Christ is... It's what the church needs. The church needs more men who are theologically adept and theologically rigorous, but at the same time have those shepherd's hearts, which you clearly have. And uh, may the Lord raise many more like you to to shepherd, to educate, to train, to build up the body of Christ. So appreciate that answer and, and, and your uh, your time with us. Well, it's so great to be with you. Lord's blessings on all of you and, and the work you're doing there in Nebraska and, and at the church and through this podcast may... May God be glorified through Christ uh, by the Spirit. We should be Trinitarian. (laughs) Amen. 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 Well, as always on the Sound Words podcast, the final word goes to God in His Word, where Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13, retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus.
Thanks for listening.